Friends, we welcome you, you who braved the cold, to be with us. This is a, an especially dirty trick to play on our guest, Dr. David Walker, who comes from University of California, Santa Barbara, to walk into this winter wonderland, it feels like, out there. I welcome all of you uh, today. Uh, we're glad to, to have you here at this Maxwell Institute guest lecture. My name is Spencer Fluman. I'm the executive director of the Maxwell Institute and would like to invite all of you, if you haven't already, to follow us on your social media platform of choice. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Find us wherever you uh, like to access content. You can find me, the executive director, on Twitter and TikTok. Just kidding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only two people knew what that was. It changes fast, people. Uh, our, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter at mi.byu.edu, uh, and that'll keep you up to date on all of the events that we have and our, the great speakers we have coming through uh, to BYU. I'll introduce our speaker after an opening prayer uh, offered by Dr. Philip Barlow, Associate Director of the Maxwell Institute. Our Father in heaven, let me pause for a moment before our session to um, thank thee as we regularly do for the university, for the place of learning. We're thankful for our guest, David Walker, to be with us. Thankful for his um, gifts and labors uh, as we focus with him, learn from him, exchange with him today. We. Um, hope to gain historical insight, historical context for our own lives and settings as a nation, as a more local people. Uh, we're grateful for so many things that we are or should be more aware of. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dr. David Walker received his PhD in Religious Studies at Yale University in 2013. Since that, he's taught in the Religious Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His work focuses on intersections of religion, settlement policy, technology, and popular culture in the long 19th century. His ongoing research projects concern theories of religion, citizenship, and historical progress formed through the Gilded Age bureaucracies, land-grant disputes, P.T. Barnum's circuses, and Harry Houdini's magic shows. For real. It's good stuff. Recent publications treat ritual innovations in spiritualism and stage magic, railroad companies' influence on popular understandings of Mormonism. Dr. Walker's 2014 article, Transporting Mormonism, Railroads, and Religious Sensation in the American West won the Best Article Award from both the Mormon History Association and the Utah Department of Heritage and Arts. Today, his talk is entitled Saints and Other Western Wonders, Tourist Interests in the Railroad Age. And it draws on his newly published book from the University of North Carolina Press, Railroading Religion, Mormons, Tourists, and the Corporate Spirit of the West. It's a case study in religious development and bureaucratic incorporation in the West. Railroading religion tracks the rise of Mormonism as a category of both scholarly and popular imagination, highlighting the corporate mechanisms by which the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and religion generally were contested and contained within the tightening grip of an emergent transcontinental market. Rather than destroying Mormonism, and spreading a distinctly secular America, which was the stated aspiration of many politicians and promoters at the time, Walker argues in this book that railroads and affiliated industries in fact mobilized and incorporated multiple religious interests and moreover, they mainlined Mormonism in time. 
Uh, a few copies of the book are available for purchase um, afterward, and also uh, in lieu of a full Q&A session during our session today, Dr. Walker is happy to uh, stay behind a few minutes and answer your questions one-on-one -on -one if you'd like. Please help me welcome Dr. Walker today. Thank you to the Maxwell Institute for hosting me today. Thank you, Spencer, for your kind words of welcome. And if I may be allowed to add a few more words of welcome myself, at least in recognition of the upcoming holiday, sometimes known as Indigenous Peoples Day, I want to I begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on some of the traditional homelands of different Numic-speaking peoples and of the Timpanogos Utes in particular. I want to acknowledge those groups' connections to this region, and I want to give thanks for the opportunity to live and learn here ourselves in the mixed company that's assembled here today. And by way of transition to my talk then, I want to also note that visitors to Utah lands in the early railroad era, some 150 years ago, I note that railroad visitors seldom read any such acknowledgement in their tourism guidebooks, nor did they hear as much from their tour guides Quite the contrary, quite the contrary, indigenous peoples were continually written out of the histories of these lands, especially from histories written in and for the transcontinental era. Now this, this will likely come as no surprise to anyone in this room. We're familiar with the colonial presumptions of 19th century railroad boosters, that railroads would displace native peoples and facilitate the kind of settlement and industry and government oversight that would solve the Indian problem for good. Of course, all of these phrases should be placed in scare quotes. As I've said, as I've said, none of this should be especially surprising to us, even as we've come to recognize it for what it is and what it was. Devastating, truly. Neither, neither, as I've said, neither would it have been surprising to most 19th century tourists that natives would be described thus. Few tourists would have expected to find a land acknowledgement in their guidebooks, at least not one that highlighted in positive terms the, the continuing presence of indigenous peoples in the West, or their rightly positive place in national consciousness overall, by virtue of a close relationship to the land. Now, that said, was surprising to many of those same travelers, and what remains underappreciated today, I think, is the degree to which all of those same things were said about so-called Mormons in 19th century railroad guidebooks. As an aside, I, I want to note that insofar as I refer to Latter-day Saints as Mormons and to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint and its culture as Mormonism in this talk, I do so, I do so as a historian in order both to reflect and also to assess how such M words were used by saints and outsiders alike themselves during the period of my research. Okay, what, what I'm saying is that many travelers did find land acknowledgments of a sort for Mormons and Mormon culture in their guidebooks. They found, they found statements asserting that these were Mormons' traditional homelands, that Mormon culture had an intimate and indelible relationship to them, and moreover, that Mormons might well be accepted into the nation on the grounds of that relationship. So this is, this is the story that I'd like to trace today in part. I wish to tell a story about how railroad guidebooks and the greater tourism industry of which they were a part, how they told stories about Utah lands that simultaneously overlooked native populations and yet naturalized Latter-day Saint presence in Utah in very particular ways. By my reading, by my reading, tourism guides presented Mormonism as especially indigenous to Utah and simultaneously as a colonial resource to the nation as a whole. Now, railroad agents had certain reasons for representing Mormonism in this way, as we'll see, but such discourse was of mutual interest also to some saints who simultaneously sourced 
and capitalized on its terms. So thus, thus, this is a story of promotional codependence in the West and of railroad tourism as an industry of cultural displacement for some, and yet also of religious placement and representation for others. Indeed, it's a story of railroad building as both a Mormon enterprise and a Mormon making enterprise. It's a story that is not only of how railroads affected Mormonism, affected here being spelled with an A, but also how railroading affected Mormonism, how it created and authorized a certain Mormonism in a certain place, both in fact and in public imagination. Now, my book, Railroading Religion, offers a sustained analysis of both the affects and the effects of Mormon railroad relations in the late 19th century. It's an investigation of the ways in which, by my accounting, railroads and tourism became dominant mechanisms by which Americans came to understand Mormonism and indeed to accept its religious significance in and for the nation as a whole. Now, there are numerous parts to this argument, and I won't try to touch upon them all today. What I'll attempt instead is a talk that interweaves certain storylines while introducing you to the types of data that I explore at greater length in the book. To that end, then, I'd like to nominate as today's point of entry into the history of Mormonism's transcontinental connections, I'd like to nominate the following exchange from 1888. In that year, Charles Francis Adams, Jr., then president of the Union Pacific Railroad, Adams wrote to Edwards Roberts, a professional travel writer, regarding Roberts' forthcoming guidebook. Adams was slated to write a preface to Roberts' book, and he planned to sell it along his line to promote travel on the Union Pacific and its branches. After receiving an advanced copy of the text, though, Adams expressed concerns about Roberts' depictions of Utah and Mormonism. He advised Roberts to omit all critical and derogatory passages for, as he said, among our customers are the Mormons, a book brought out under the auspices of the Union Pacific should, therefore, in my opinion, contain nothing which is offensive to the Mormons. No good tradesman has a right to offend any customer, no matter what his opinions may be, provided he is civil and pays his bills. And to us, Mormons have always been civil, and they have always paid their bills. So the, the resultant text spoke then not of quote, barbarism in Salt Lake City, nor of the, quote, treasonable and seditious leadership of church authorities. Such terms had appeared in Roberts's first draft, but Adams made him cut them, while adding also a note of caution to his readers that you shouldn't believe all of the things that you read in anti-Mormon literature. Instead, significantly, also by Adams's request, Roberts in instructed readers to pay close attention to geography, and environment in the Mormon Great Basin, and to imagine their relationship to Utah and culture and religion. This is important. Indeed, I don't think it's too much to say that such instructions, when coupled by railroad lobbyists' complementary work among national politicians and newspapermen, such instructions mainlined Utah and tourism and Mormonism alike in American minds and markets. Railroads created a particularly observant public for Mormonism and Mormon lands in the West. Now, I'll get back to this line of inquiry in a moment. For first, first I want to highlight just how surprising this corporate friendship between saints and railroad officials was to many onlookers at the time. Indeed, indeed, if we were to revisit most national celebrations of the Transcontinental Railroad's charter, archives in which, as I've already indicated, we often find predictions of Indian demise and displacement in the West, if we return to those same discussions, we'd find similar predictions made about Mormonism there. The first whistle of the locomotive in Salt Lake Valley will sound the death knell of Mormonism, announced one observer in 1868. 
in a typical instance of what I have come to call the death knell thesis. The death knell thesis predicted that trains and capitalism, by opening the West to free enterprise and liberal thought, would modernize Utah and destroy Mormondom by weakening the institutional power of the church. Now, this did not happen. And even though we are no longer surprised by this fact, it does seem to me that historians generally have failed to see how precisely the opposite happened. Rather than sounding its death knell, railroads, in fact, gave Mormonism new life. At least along certain lines, they did. And so, in order to get a better handle on these things, and to give some sense of how this argument unfolds in my book, I suggest that we might usefully return to this Adams-Roberts correspondence mentioned above with a few questions in mind. Why, why would railroad officials stand up for saints? Why then, in the 1880s? Why there, in the realm of railroad guidebooks? And why thus? Why in that way? Why by, why by prescribing geographical attention as a remedy for hostility elsewhere? Now, the, the first question is the easiest one to sketch out an answer for. Whence, whence the corporate relationship between railroad companies and Mormon institutions? That answer begins most obviously in the 1860s, when, as you all know, Brigham Young was one of the major contractors for work on the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific railroads in Utah. He subcontracted grading jobs to area bishops, and he called congregants to labor along the lines. In short order, the Union Pacific recognized deep debts to the saints, not only because of their labor, but also because Young donated lands to establish the company hub at Ogden. Now, the relationship only deepened from there in any case. After the Union Pacific agreed to pay off some of its debts in railroad in building materials and rolling stock, which, railroad, which Brigham Young then used to build a branch railroad from Salt Lake to Ogden, which the Union Pacific then came to rely upon for feeder line traffic and proceeds. So by the time of, Ed, of Adams and Roberts' correspondence in the 1880s, the Union Pacific had invested in a number of other Mormon-built branch lines as well. The relationship was not always conflict-free, but these institutions, the railroads and the church, recognized a certain institutional codependence nonetheless, and thus also a corporate friendship. Okay, so that all too brief history brought us up to the 1880s, which answers in part the question of why then? Why then did Adams defend saints? Well, he was deeply invested in Mormon railroading projects by then. But there's another answer to this as well, namely that this was an era of new and intense anti-Mormon legislation. The Edmonds-Tucker Act, which passed in 1887, the year before Adams and Roberts' correspondence, the Edmonds-Tucker Act increased punishments for polygamy, permitted seizure of church properties, and did many other things besides. An accompanying raid sent some church leaders underground and others to jail, and many persons and properties were released again only after the Woodruff Manifesto of 1890. Okay. Railroad agents were seldom public fans of polygamy, true. But, but neither did they support Edmunds Tucker or the raid. The Mormons were our friends, remember, but more crassly speaking, too, Railroads feared capitalists' reticence to invest in Utah industry during a period of political turmoil, along with any disruption to feeder line traffic. So for these reasons, in fact, railroad lobbyists had tried to scuttle the Edmunds-Tucker Act in the first place. For, for his part, Adams impressed upon congressmen that while he had no interest in interfering in the moral and criminal side of the situation in Utah, he wished not to disrupt the material side, in his words, by unduly unsettling Mormon businessmen or politicians or public works. Stay the hand of government, he pleaded, at least when it came to the material side of Utah industry and Mormon property holdings. Now, of course, the Edmunds-Tucker Act did pass, 
despite all railroad lobbying against it. But the 1880s, the 1880s were far from a total loss for the railroad lobby or the church, and neither did the passage of the Edmunds Tucker Act jeopardize their friendship. Quite the contrary, in fact. What we see in the Adams Roberts correspondence is the manifestation of a mutual commitment to protect a material side of Mormon life, otherwise threatened by Congress. Moreover, moreover, what we see there is that railroad agents were successful with the likes of travel guide authors, if not always with politicians. They were successful there in maintaining a certain tone relative both to the material side and the moral side of Mormonism. Now, I demonstrate in my book that these successes had their own payoffs during what has been called the Mormon quest for statehood some years later. But the point here is that, more, is that railroad agents were working actively across aisles and across genres in Utah and in Washington, in transcontinental guide books, as well as in national newspapers, to mainline Mormonism in American politics and popular culture alike. As railroad lobbyists worked to secure Saints' political autonomy in Utah, that is, railroad writers worked differently to secure Utah lands for Mormonism and for acts of Mormon religious observation. Okay, so all of, all of this should give some grounds to explain Adam's instructions to Roberts. Moreover, all of this language about, in Adam's words, focusing on the material side of Mormondom, and thereby, in my words, securing Utah lands for Mormonism and acts of Mormon religious imagination, that should all give a sense, too, of the rationale behind Adams' mandate to material and geographical focus in Roberts' guidebook. But there's, there's a bit more to be said along these lines, too, if you'll bear with me, about how and where this played out in practice. Now, I've read, I've read hundreds of travel and tourism guides for Utah, along with countless other depictions of saints' life from this same time. And it's, it's pretty clear to me from this research that railroad officials consistently tried to tread a middle route between anti-Mormon and pro-Mormon interests when promoting travel in the Great Basin throughout the 1870s and 1880s. So here's, here's how that worked. Positioning itself somewhere between alarmist exposés of Mormonism on the one hand and LDS apologetics on the other, most Utah railroad literature tried to keep alive a rhetoric of curiosity and distinctiveness about Utah while taking care not to scare away Gentile travelers. The maximizing of passenger traffic in Utah required that its religious curiosities be rendered distinctly visible and visitable, they thought. Railroads, excuse me, religions, at least unusual religions, needed to be made objects of touristic visitation. And tourists needed to be enticed by opportunities to debate and discover the stuff of religion in situ, on site. Sometimes, sometimes this situational work involved the wholesale corporate fabrication of Mormon sacred sites, other times, it entailed strategic nods to critiques and concerns at specific places. And still others, it entailed re redirecting travelers' attention to different sites, and perhaps teaming up with Latter-day Saint hosts to tell new stories there. So I'd like to offer an example of each. First, an example of invention. One of the first Utah places in which the, the Union Pacific Railroad took interest and around which it built a particular narrative about Mormonism is Pulpit Rock, here at the head of Echo Canyon along the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, this, this is how Transcontinental Guidebooks introduced Pulpit Rock to a traveling public starting in 1869. Pulpit Rock is on our right hand, they said in a step-by-step -step narration of important things seen by the train. 
Pulpit Rock is on our right hand, and Brigham Young preached from it his very first sermon in Utah, addressed to the pioneers, then on their way to Salt Lake City in 1847. This was where Brigham Young stopped, they said, and inspired by an environment that was simultaneously sublime and severe, this is where Young de declare, declared and decided, this is almost our place. We are almost to our rightful home. It is so close, said the guidebooks, with excitement. We can almost touch it. Now, of course, of course, this entire experience was fabricated by the railroads completely. There's no evidence that Brigham Young or other Mormon emigrants ever stopped there during their overland treks. It was just a rock. It just happened to be there along the railway route into Utah, and that was just good enough for a story. It was like a four Gentiles version of the This is the Place proclamation at Immigration <laughs> Canyon, which itself was about two days walk away from the railroad line. The Pulpit Rock story was a story, but not just any story. This was a story about the nature of Mormon pasts and about Mormons' supposed connections to their land. Moreover, and I think this is equally important, moreover, Pulpit Rock was one of the key sites around which railroads claimed Middle Eastern likenesses for both Mormons and their land. Four, when describing Mormons' supposed experiences there, many guidebooks reached for a quote by Sir Richard Francis Burton, who, when nearing Salt Lake Valley himself in 1860, had written that the pilgrim emigrants, like the Hajis of Mecca and Jerusalem, give vent there to the emotions long pent up within their bosoms by sobs and tears, laughter and congratulations, psalms and hysterics. It is indeed no wonder that the ignorant should fondly believe that the Spirit of God pervades the very atmosphere, and that Zion on the tops of the mountains is nearer heaven than other parts of the earth. Now, a few train-era guides reproduced this passage in its entirety while describing Pulpit Rock or its surroundings. Others altered it slightly. But in any case, railroads asked travelers to visualize themselves coming off the plains, awed by the canyons, inspired by the vista. They created, they created a kind of ethnographic role play for tourists asking them to picture themselves in a historical scenario that was partly fabricated for the occasion. Moreover, too, and in any case as well, railroad guidebooks retained Burton's notion of graphic and geographic similarity between Mormonism, Islam, and Judaism, for they considered such to be good incitement to Utah, Utah and travel even for travelers who didn't want to play Mormon along the way. And thus it was that, through word, image, and in time also maps, railroad publicity departments pushed cultural geographical comparisons between Utah and the Holy Land far more than the church itself did at the time, mind you. They pushed this geographical comparison in order to entice commercial travelers to Utah on a kind of domestic counterpart to Middle Eastern pilgrimage. So these friends are just a couple of the visual cues by which railroad companies fostered among travelers a sense of Mormonism as a particularly placed religion. Mormons were who they were because of where they were, they said. According to these guidebooks, Mormonism happened within a geography, it imagined a geography, and it could be understood in terms of that geography. It was still an open matter of inquiry, quote, whether Mormonism be a religion or not, one book said to its readers. But the railroads, by their own accounts, would tell people where to find it, they would help them to see it, and they would give them the platforms, itineraries, opportunities, pictures, maps, and words with which to get there and decide for themselves. If, if and when travelers reached Salt Lake City, then they were guided through Mormonism's built environment as well. 
And here again, Taurus looked for expressions of rel religiosity that was already associated with geography. And railroad officials continued to structure and mediate their expectations. Now, I had written an overlong section here about representations of the Temple Block in the Edmunds Tucker era and how Mormon hosts mobilized to meet and to shape the gaze of the tourists who gathered there, coming off of their experiences at Echo Canyon. But I'll, I'll leapfrog that section for now in the interest of time, pointing interested parties to the book and saying only this for now. And one of the things I was sort of excited, interested to find out when doing research for my book was that Heber J. Grant ran a livery company in Salt Lake City, which he chartered, chartered in 1888 with seed money from the First Presidency. The express purpose of Grant's company was to meet tourists at railway stations and by escorting them to certain downtown sites, including the Tabernacle and Brigham Young's grave, to manage accompanying narratives there. Now, surely, surely the Grant Brothers Livery Company was an important part of the Utah tourism industry. But it links up with the present storyline in even more direct ways, too, for the Grant Brothers struck a direct deal with Adams's Union Pacific which guaranteed them preferential access to those Gentile tourists at those downtown stations. This too, this too was in 1888, the same year as our Adams Roberts correspondence. And thus, and thus Adams, who was at that time, that same time making Roberts cut an entire section containing a critical reading of tabernacle services and endowment house practices. Adams made sure by contracting simultaneously with Grant that the gaps created by such guidebook omissions could then be filled by Mormon voices themselves on site. And not just any Mormon voices, mind you, but the voices of Heber J. Grant and associates. And thus, and thus we see here that Grant, a man famous later for what has been called the Grant synthesis between collectivist and capitalist endeavors, we see here that Grant was himself sort of cutting his teeth in the tourism business precisely in the venue in which Mormons were trained early to seek a certain balance between openness and enclosure, capitalism and communalism, sales and concessions in the public eye and the railroad era. We see also that Grant, who was at that time moving to protect other Mormon properties from Edmund Tucker's seizure by different means behind the scenes, we see here that Grant may have perceived probably rightly, that the fate of Temple Block was better tried in courts of touristic interest in continuing collaboration with the Union Pacific. For can we not picture Grant or his brothers standing at Brigham Young's grave with tourists themselves holding Roberts' new guidebook while Grant and Roberts together invited them to consider whether any national concerns about Mormon autocracy and secrecy and the like were really just matters of the past dead and buried with Brigham Young, and thus whether modern-day saints deserve to keep and to keep building the structures that they saw below them. I, I for one, have pictured this, and notably, some of the tourists who had been able to trace to these tours decided, yes, saints should keep them, and they wrote as much both in their journals and in more public venues. This was an impactful tour for many, and it was an impactful industry for all. Now, I'd like, to, I'd like to tell one last story about the impact of tourism on Mormon imagination and about the constraints as well as the possibilities that were attendant to it, both in the 19th century and today. Like the pulpit, rock, and temple block stories before it, this is a tale about guidebooks asking tourists how and where does Mormonism rightly reside in Utah? But this story shows how, even if railroad officials kept strategic silence at certain places while contracting with locals to offer on-site explanations, even while that was the case, guidebooks were much more heavy-handed when it came to describing different downtown landmarks and when articulating their religious experience or their religious importance. Now, perhaps foremost among these landmarks 
or canals. Truly, guidebooks talked a lot about canals. And goodness knows they made sure that Taurus did too. Indeed, indeed, it was in consideration of irrigation canals in Utah that guidebooks most obviously sort of picked up their interpretive lines that were sketched out at Pulpit Rock and in the Promised Land image. Outside of the Wasatch Mountains and Pulpit Rock, that is, railroad guidebooks were most invested in mapping correspondences between Utah topography and religious expressions alongside Mormon waterworks and irrigation systems. By guidebooks accounting, canals will, were special sites of correspondence between the natural and the built environments of Mormondom. And as such, they were clear avenues for religious reflection. Now, Edwards Roberts had a lot to say about all of this, according to Adams' instructions, but another guidebook is, is perhaps more typical in terms of its reporting. So ruminating at length on the grounds around the tabernacle, for instance, the author wrote that the gutters, or rather the ditches, carry streams of pure, clear mountain water, which serves to irrigate the gardens, lawns, and enclosures, and to these trenches is due the luxuriant growth of trees, flowers, plants, and bushes, which give Salt Lake City the appearance of one vast park and flower garden. There is, as a result, an oriental air about the city, which carries one back to the banks of the biblical Jordan, and which is unlike that of any other city in the Union. So observations of canals led to appreciations of public de decorum and evocations of biblical topography. By guidebooks' accounts, then, whereas Pulpit Rock may have evoked sentiments reminiscent of the Hajis of Mecca or Jerusalem, Salt Lake Waterways likened Mormon's promised land unto Jerusalem in the more staid and pastoral key of the Hebrew Bible. Mountain passes and man-made rivers thus complemented each other by this accounting, insofar as they witnessed to Mormons behaving variously like Muslims and Jews. So you will note, please note, that both Pulpit Rock and Salt Lake Canals evoked a sense of geographical determinism in Mormon life by this accounting. But also that, by this account, irrigation canals showed saints' ability to reshape the same nature that had supposedly shaped them, too. So the guidebooks went on, ignoring the prevalence of pre-Mormon irrigation practices as well as the fecundity of some Utah soils. Tourism promoters reported matter-of-factly that Mormons had invented irrigation, even as they had naturally hybridized older social patterns complementary to the task. Close-knit villages, communally-oriented trade, large families, and the like. Mormons were first and foremost an agricultural people, according to this refrain. They were industrious, but not industrialized. Okay. There are a couple things for us to say here, beyond noting the irony of an entire industry being mobilized to promote a picture of pastoralism. The first, the first is that they were not wrong when describing the importance of irrigation to Utah and life, or when hinting at its relation to Latter-day Saint systems of trusteeship and the like. And these were indeed helpful things for Americans at large to hear softening as they did certain prejudices about the substance of Mormon communal concern, and also paving the way for national appreciation of saints' farming me methods as valuable to Western settlement. Now that said, Neither were they innocent or absent of politics in their presentation. To the contrary, arguments about things valuable to Western settlement were seldom innocent at the time. And so here is, here's where I'd like to point you back to the sort of darker implications of railroad suggestion that Mormons were the inventors of modern irrigation in an environment that was naturally theirs. For it was around irrigation canals that railroad guidebooks pivoted, finally, to a mention of native peoples in the Great Basin. And they did so only briefly then, too, only 
so long as it took to compare what they cast as Mormons' righteous survival in the Railroad Age to what they cast as Indians' natural demise. This can be hard stuff to read, but here it is. Here it is that we see that if railroad publications, if railroad publications endeavored to naturalize saints' presence in Utah through suggestions of geographical determinism as well as geographical conquest in Mormon life, they did so with contrast to American Indian experience. For here it was that guidebooks like Roberts claimed that whereas Mormons and Indians might both be imagined as having pre-modern or ecstatic experiences in places like Echo Canyon, only Mormons escaped being fully entrapped and entombed by them. Roberts said all of this, by the way, while pointing to a supposed tomb near the Great Salt Lake that housed, he said, the last members of an ancient Utah tribe. So Adams, Adams and Roberts' worldly gospel, as they called it, thus amounted to the claim that Mormons, unlike Indians, managed to dominate and domesticate the same geography that also constrained and constructed them, especially through their irrigation systems. Moreover, Mormons, unlike Indians, were said to have made and to have, be, have made publicly available particularly tangible materials by which to theorize different modes of religious expression as at Pulpit Rock and Temple Block. Thus, thus, railroads helped Americans in general to see Mormons themselves as a colonial resource, one whose supposed capacity to displace Indians while anchoring modern religious concerns was equally, if not more valuable, than any of Utah's natural deposits, natural mineral deposits, might have been. So here we see, here we see how railroad promoters aligned Mormons with the, way, the same white colonial projects that Mormons were also made subject to in other ways. Put differently, here we see how railroads, while defending saints from the type of destruction predicted by the anti-Mormons death knell thesis, here we see how railroads defended Mormons partly by casting them as amenable to the same anti-Indian ambitions of the same biased groups. Now, I wish I could say that Mormons were only cast thus and that saints did not also align themselves with some of the same colonial projects to which they were also made subject. But that would be too simple, too wist wishful and wistful a statement. For the fact is, of course, that Mormons sometimes mobilized to meet Taurus' gaze in ways that indeed met it rather than challenged it. Now, let me pause here for a moment to say that my book tracks several different storylines respecting what I call the railroading of religion in and for Utah in the late 19th century. Sometimes I mean by this railroading religion, sometimes I signal the rush to override particular Latter-day Saint practices or else the corporate management of different religious concerns in the ostensible interest of national unity. Sometimes I signal, rather, railroad agents' effort to facilitate saints' visitability for newly mobile publics. And sometimes I mean the mechanisms by which railroad officials, tourism agents, tourists themselves, and saints themselves collectively negotiated a, a mainline identity for Mormonism in the modern era. Now, very often this narrative proceeds in the key of irony in any case as I describe how Mormon groups both incorporated and benefited from the very same enterprises that death knellers presumed would destroy them. These stories are occasionally rather playful in tone too, at least I think so. For instance, when I describe how, how saints staged winking portrayals of railroad arrival and death knell dramas at the Salt Lake Theater, where Mormons gathered to watch Gentiles gathering to watch them, or when saints built elaborate tourist attractions that winked at and capitalized on Orientalist fantasies in the post-manifesto era. Sometimes I trace the circulation of railroad-derived images and storylines in Latter-day Saint publications, and sometimes I trace circulations moving in the opposite direction, as railroad writers amplified or rebranded Mormon-made materials. 
And of course, I attend to the many ways in which actual tourists navigated this swirl of images and these excitements to visitation before, during, and after their own trips to Utah. Okay, to repeat, some of this narrative and this argument unfolds in the key of irony, and sometimes irony is or can be an amusing affair. But sometimes, sometimes it is also tragic. Indeed, it is often quite dark, provided that we attend, as we must, provided that we attend also to the full range of histories and populations that were written or ridden off while powerful agents wrote and underwrote others. And so it is with this in mind that I wish, I wish to pick up a narrative thread from a few minutes ago before my excursion into book summary land, because what, what we're looking at today is a less playful storyline in good part, and we need to see it through. For, as I've said, and as I'll say again now, Mormons were not only cast from the outside as a valuable colonial resource based on their supposed capacity to displace natives while also anchoring modern religious concerns. Saints were not only cast thus, but they also mobilized sometimes to meet Taurus' corresponding gaze in ways that indeed met it rather than challenged it. Now, one, one need only look to the Deseret Museum which John W. Young designed specifically as a tourist attraction to see how that played out. One might also look to the Utah Exposition Palace car, which the Union Pacific lent to the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce in 1888 in order to sort of take their collaborative Mormon defenses on the road. But I'll go with the Deseret Museum for now. For the museum's 1870s and 1880s celebrations of Utah and life, said little to nothing about contemporaneous indigenous populations or practices, preferring instead to cast Mormons' Western legitimacy and national value in contrast to them. So Transcontinental Railroad tourists would have looked in vain for representations or discussions of, say, Washakie at the Deseret Museum, for instance, let alone other communities less intimately connected to the saints. Now, of course, it's unclear whether tourists would have known to look for such representations in the first place, given guidebooks' silence on the subject. But again, perhaps they would have. For the fact was that Native peoples were all over Utah, for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. Where were they? Well, they were riding trains. They were trading at train stations. They were gathering seasonally around Corinne. They were on reservations in the north and the south and the east of Salt Lake, and they were in many other spaces between. Indeed, some indigenous groups were trying to set up tourist displays of their own around then, too. For instance, when a group of Northwestern Shoshone hosted a powwow, advertising it as a free event for visitors, and then, smartly, demanded an exit fee when it was done. But but perhaps for, save, save perhaps for the photographic work of C.R. Savage, whose Indian portraits did sometimes appeal to tourists and did sometimes garner, garner national attention, much of this activity seemed as if a public secret in popular representations and in the authorized displays of the Deseret Museum and the Union Pacific and the like. Again, anyone with eyes to see could have seen that their collective silence on this front was a lie but neither did many people or many powerful people do much to belie it. I have a couple more minutes. In any case, this may well be the time to disclose the title of the book that we've been talking about for much of the last 40 minutes. Edwards Roberts's Union Pacific Sanctioned Guidebook, his guidebook, was titled Shoshone and Other Western Wonders. But as we've seen, there were very few Shoshone in it. Granted, granted Roberts's title referenced Shoshone Falls, which the Union Pacific was hoping to promote as a tourist attraction, but still, there was little to no discussion about the actual Shoshones who lived in its vicinity or visited it themselves or after whom it was named. Railroads, railroads were much more interested in making saints 
a Western wonder. Making saints a Western wonder at that time than they were the Shoshone, or any other group for that matter. Indeed, one need only track their land acknowledgments, or their lack thereof, to see as much. One need only track with the ways in which rail railroad promoters invested in and amplified notions of cultural significance in some places while overriding others elsewhere to see what their corporate priorities were and who their corporate friends were at any given time. Now, I'll state again that it was by no means a foregone conclusion that Latter-day Saints would have been counted among railroads' closest friends and best customers, either in the 1860s or the 1880s or beyond. Such friendship, rather, marked an ironic turn against the ubiquitous terms and powerful proponents of the death knell thesis. And while we, we in this room and in this center and in this institution and in this field, while we may debate the degree to which the industries of such irony shaped Mormonism in positive or negative ways, while we may debate that, I think it is beyond question that tourism and railroads were powerfully productive forces in and for Mormon history and the statehood of some Utah religions, notwithstanding many predictions to the contrary. If I may conclude in 70 seconds. In 1869, 150 years ago this year, anti-Mormons predicted that railroad connections would destroy Mormonism. Little did they know that over the next 25 years, Latter-day Saint officials and businessmen would flip that secular script entirely, repeatedly finding ways either to bend railroads to their benefit or to reshape Mormon institutions themselves in, in order to flourish in their increasingly networked world. Meanwhile, railroad barons seeking favorable contracts and uninterrupted freighting not to mention also the lucrative receipts of transcontinental tourism, they cultivated friendships with Latter-day Saint businessmen in Utah, intervened on their behalf in Congress, and worked elsewhere to ensure the commensurability of their interests. Of course, of course such, such interventions on behalf of Mormon stability seem sometimes to be the stuff entirely of cold calculation about a basic bottom line, the desire to make money. And sometimes it seems that people's focus on geography, the geography of Mormondom, was intended much more as a mode of containment and restriction than of national mobility. But then again, then again, there are moments when railroad officials seem genuinely to have cared about Latter-day Saint people and practices in the Great Basin. And when they wanted above all to exert a humanizing influence on an erstwhile dismissive at best and demonizing at worst popular gaze to provide a space, that is, for real human respite and real religious freedom in Utah. The result of their overlapping efforts was, in any case, the combined naturalizing in Utah and mainlining in America of Mormonism, as tourists especially were convinced that saints were a spectacularly geographical people from whom they might learn to conquer and cultivate Western lands and that they evoked safely an oriental otherness around which Americans might learn to locate and define religion in the modern West. By the 1890s, Mormonism status was secure. It was a railroad, it was a railroad religion. It was a religion of and for the railroad era. Thank you. Thanks for listening.